What is up, my peeps? Joshua Smith here with another GSD Mode podcast interview where every single week I interview top real estate professionals, top entrepreneurs, and straight up top badasses that they're dominating their space. These are people choosing to not live a life of mediocrity, but instead to go out and create big, amazing, epic lives for themselves, their families, and have a big impact on others. And today, you guys, we got another special rock star guest here on the GSD Mode podcast. Our guest today, you guys, is the vice president of direct lending at OnQ Financial has over 20 years of experience in finance. Um, and to be able to create the success that he has created throughout his career in the real estate industry, you know, he's had to keep a massive and continue to keep a massive, highly, highly engaged, I guess, pulse, if you will, high level pulse on what's taking place in the housing market. So I'm really stoked and honored to have Christian Owen on the show. Welcome to the show. Awesome, thanks so much. Really appreciate you guys giving me the time today. Um, I was flattered that, that you know you kind of reached out, invited me on. I'm, I'm super stoked to be here and, and look forward to sharing you know, a little bit about what, what I know about uh, what's made us on cue, myself, et cetera, successful. You know, hope, hope some of the, uh, the listeners can, can gather a couple bullet points from it. Yeah, man. And, and you guys, you know, I'm here in, in the Phoenix area, you know, right? And you know your headquarters is here, right? you know, drive around, see your offices all around. But you guys have expanded and grown, so it's not you're not just here. I mean, you. I think before we hit the record button, you're you have what 85 different offices and locations throughout the country. Yeah, we're north of uh, of 80. Uh, you know, currently, uh, you know, we're 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 a lender in, in uh, you know 46 states, I believe, uh, and uh, you know, and try to provide the best customer experience out there. But yeah, Tempe is our our headquarters. Uh, you said you drive around to see the offices, those are mostly production offices, but uh, we love Arizona, we love being here. Yeah, love it. And one thing, I, I, you know, we don't have a lot of uh, lenders or those tied to the, the mortgage industry here on the show. I mean, we've had a few, but one thing that I, mainly it's realtors, right? But one thing I love about bringing on lenders and, and those tied to the lending industry, um, like yourself is, I mean, our, our, our relationship is so intertwined. You know, now mm -hmm. I get that my team structure is different than most large teams that are my size, you know, but uh, meaning a lot of teams focus on the listing side. My focus is, is on the buy side. We're 72% buy side. And, you know, I tell oh. realtors this constantly that your relationship with your lender partner is almost as important as your clients, you know, right? In, in my opinion, all the vendor partnerships out there, it's, it's the most important partnership. And there's just so much that we can do to help each other build up our successes. Um, you know, but before we get into to talking about all of that and what you guys are doing today, you know, I'm intrigued always in our guests journeys that led them down this path in the first place, you know, like what, you know, what, what, how'd you wind up in the real estate space? Yeah. So, I mean, I started my career, um, geez, I'm into my forties now. So, uh, you know, let's call it a little over 20 years ago, uh, in New York on wall street as a grunt smiling and dialing. And, uh, you know, I started, I started in a class of about 45 trainees, we'll call it. And, uh, you know, by the end of week one, there was about 10 left. And the, uh, and, and the end of week two, there were about, you know, six left. Uh, <clears throat> but basically smiling and dialing, you know, watch the sun come up, the sun set from, uh, from our office. Uh, I mean, you know, it, you, you can attest to that there, there's no catalyst like hard work. The harder you work, the luckier you get, just the way it is, right? So carried that with me, obviously, throughout my career. Um, one point, I, I chose to come back home. I was uh, building, developing uh, typically multifamily product, projects uh, on and around the valley, just locally. Uh, <clears throat> we started to expand out into Tunica, Mississippi. We were doing a... Uh, a conference center, a casino, a water park, a couple of hotels. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, 2008 hit, financing started to fall through. Um, and, and I found myself with, uh, with a couple other buddies getting into the, uh, the lead space of, uh, of mortgages. We were the number one shop on the West Coast, uh, basically delivering live lead transfers to mortgage bankers, mortgage brokers, uh, very large companies. And uh, that kind of led me to where I'm at today with OnQ Financial. Uh, you know, wanted to come over here. Uh, it was an awesome opportunity. I was extremely uh, surprised and happy when the CEO reached out, and, and I consider it tapped me to kind of to kind of come over and, and, and build this out with them. So that's uh, that's that, that's the elevator pitch version of it. 
Yeah, love it, dude. So, man, all right. So you you jumped into generating leads to be able then to to distribute to different financial institutions. But that I mean, yeah. that was a you know two thousand eight, two thousand nine, man. That that was uh, you know people were were barely hanging on to their homes, losing their homes left and right. You know, right? Um, I have to imagine lead generation during that time, especially for getting people to want to buy homes or even be able to refinance, was a, a big challenge. You know, right? So. What, what were some of the, you know, and the reason that I ask is, you know, our market today, real estate market is much different than obviously 2008. However, lead generation has also become very challenging because of the, the, you know, let's just say the Zillows of the world, you know, right? Yeah. I mean, they're not even in a lot of markets like here in Arizona, they're not even selling the leads anymore, you know, right? It's, it's a 35% referral fee. So you got these juggernaut companies that are trying to become the lead distributors. So it's a lot harder for real estate agents or lenders to direct you know, directly get their own leads themselves, you know, right? So sure. what, what were some things that you were doing or if you were in that lead gen space today, like what recommendations would you give? <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, the way we did it back then is a lot different than how we do it now. But you're right, Zillow, I, I can't even buy a mortgage lead in Zillow, in, in, for Zillow mortgage lead in Arizona. I've been, I've been on the waiting list for a year and a half and I've got friends over there. Um, so I, I agree, you know, it's, it's a challenging lead environment. Back then, I kind of went back to my old, um, you know, Wall Street roots, put a team of guys together. We had, at one point, we had about 70 guys on the phone. We smiled and dialed, uh, refi business, streamline FHA, VA business, trigger leads, things like that, right? Um, I think in today's market, you know, some of the advice that I would give is, and, and I see this when I hire and throughout our organization, um, and, you know, and I'll probably come back to it multiple times, but there's, there's two things that you really need to consider when you're, when you're talking about, you know, lead generation. You know, the first one is probably how are you leveraging technology? If there's only one of you, if you're a smaller team, excuse me, how are you leveraging that technology to keep in touch with these borrowers, with these home shoppers, with anybody within the real estate industry, as we'll call it as a whole, right? Um, how are you using contact strategy? And the second is hard work. I mean, I think you've probably seen as much as I've seen it. You know, there are some people that, that think they're going to get into real estate or finance or something and think, oh, it's easy. My buddy makes, you know, 250000 a year. He's, he's crushing it. Well, they didn't see that, you know, nine years he starved for, all the no's he got to get to that, those first five yeses. And, uh, and, and I think that's the misconception of the industry, and there's so many things in our industry that can have a deal fall out, right, as, as I'm sure you well know. Um, but those two things, I mean, having a great contact strategy, meaning having a good CRM that you use, setting up automated text campaigns, automated drip campaigns, um, you know, I even still like old school methods, using, using mail drops to, uh, to keep in touch with your current and past clientele base. Uh, I think, you know, you guys uh, on the real estate side are a lot more client facing than we are. I can't tell you how many, how many loans we do for a customer now that, that we don't ever even see face to face, right? So and you, you, with the cost of customer acquisition and how much we spend financially and time-wise internally at our company, on making sure that customer has a flawless experience, uh, we want that person to come back to us the next time that, that they go around. And that's really just done through, you know, again, through hard work, contact strategy, CRM, uh, you know, and, and always trying to think outside the box. Yeah, love it, man. So then, you know, when it comes to technology, you know, right, um, you know, a lot of people in, in all spaces are, are leveraging technology is so hard, but then they, they end up losing, I guess, the, the great customer service, the great customer experience, you know, right? What would your recommendation be? Or what are some of the things that you guys are doing really well that, you know, you can utilize technology to, to allow yourself to be more effective and efficient, but not remove the human connection element? Right. A, a couple of things. Um, you know, I'd say first and foremost, the way that I have some, you know, the majority of my team run is the only time they're sending a text and an email, and I have it obviously built up within the campaign, um, but they're making a phone call first, right? Let's not forget about the phone. I mean, text and email, marketing, and, and keeping in touch with borrowers, home shoppers, et cetera, is, is a definitely, definitely a great way to keep them involved and streamlines your process. 
but you can't forget. You got to get in front of these people. You got to whether whether it's a video call, you know, such, such as we may be doing now with the technologies out there with Zoom. I, I'm implementing that into a lot of our direct lending strategy. Uh, <clears throat> people seem to really like engaging that way. It's a, it's a more personal feel. Uh, but you got to pick that phone up. You got to talk to them, and you got to provide value. I think one of the ways, and it really no matter what you're selling, that first call should be 30% you talking, 70% them talking. You know, you need to, to kind of drill down. What, what are my goals? What are your goals as a home shopper? You know, what are your goals with financing this home? How long are you going to have it? Um, you know, because you, and, and anybody can provide the service that you and I are providing. It's how in tune, how much are they willing to give to create a great uh, experience for that customer, uh, you know, and, and, and how a few times, and if they don't, uh, if they don't hit it off right away, you know, they kind of abandon that customer, right? And that one is not a great customer experience, whereas it takes a long time to nurture a customer, a home shopper, a finance candidate, and, uh, you, you know, uh, other great ways are, are doing, you know, happy hours, luncheons, things like that where you can have a few of them come to, maybe some past clients that have had a, a great experience. You invite some new clients that you're home shopping with. You know, they mingle, oh, yeah, you know, Christian did a great job for us, Brian, Jeff, whoever did a great job for us. Um, and, and let them sell you for you, you know. Yep, yep, love it. Now, you mentioned uh, earlier about, the amount of time, energy, money, and just focus that you guys put into the actual client experience and making sure that they have a brilliant experience. So then that they come back to you, which, you know, I, I think is something that we all want, you know, right. Um, but yeah. real estate agents statistically are the worst with this. You know, the NAR yeah. stat is something like 88% of buyers and sellers said they'd love to, to they had a great experience, would love to use their agent again, but only 11% did a repeat transaction. So, you know, there, there's some follow-up element after the fact that needs to happen to keep front of mind. But then also, you know, I, I hear a lot of agents and, and, some, and I've, been, I've had these questions too throughout my career of people talk about make sure it's a brilliant customer experience for them. But sometimes you're like, well, what does that even mean? Like, what do I do? Like, what are you guys doing to kind of take it to the next level with the high level of attention that you give this to ensure that it's a great customer experience, but then also to keep those relationships live after the fact? Because that you know, when they're only buying and selling every five, seven years, or maybe, you know, refining, or, you know, it's, it could be four or five years before right. you do another deal with them. Sure. Um, well, it, it kind of comes back to first, we're leveraging technology, right? I, I think we're not the only ones to have a, uh, an online mortgage application uh, anymore, or a, a, an application on, on your iPhone that uh, we can send a customer. We, we pretty much pioneered it a long time ago, but now everybody's kind of got it. Uh, but that, for starters, uh, it interacts through an API with our system. They get an update anytime anybody touches their file, right? As well as the realtor gets that same update. So a lot of people would just leave it at that and say, hey, they got the update. But think of all the opportunities you can use this update to call the client. You know, uh, th think about. You know, now you've got a reason to call. Hey, I, I know you just got the text message that we moved your file to processing. I know you just got the text message that your offer was accepted. I wanted to talk to you about it. I want to discuss your thoughts, your concerns, any, you know, anything, any bumps in the road you see coming up. Are, are we, you know, are you sure this is the house you want? Whatever the conversation may be, use that technology to engage more with that customer. Don't just assume they they got the email, they got the text message, and and they're. You know, and, and they're satisfied with that. Um, I think ongoing, um, you know, it's it's really those, you know, and it, and it's tough to do. And you know, my guys sit down and we'll we'll do uh, you know one full weekend a quarter, uh, and and they'll drop a phone call. You know, hey, just touch and base. I know you've been in your house a year. Just want to see how it was going. I know you, you know, and have some notes too, not just a generic call. And also, what you your text messages, the clients, your emails. They can't sound canned. They need to be personalized, right? You just got to spend a little bit of extra time to, to bring a little more value. In, in yours and my industry, uh, you really got to look at, we're in, you can call us what you want, real estate agent, mortgage financier, commercial real estate agent, whatever you want, but we're really customer service representatives. 
Jones, right? That's what we are. Um, so, you know, we'll take once a quarter. We're, you know, we come in 8 to 5 Saturday, 8 to 5 Sunday. Start calling our clients. You know, we make note of who we didn't get in touch with. We'll send an email and text out, hey, you know, just uh, just dropped you a call, wanted to uh, make sure that, you know, we were front of mind, if I can be of any assistance, want to see how that addition on the house was going, you know, have some other notes, you know. I know your kids, you know, if somebody that moved from Tempe to Arcadia, hey, I know your kids started at Hopi, you wanted to see, uh, you know, hopefully it was a smooth transaction, get back to me and let me know how it went. Uh, you know, again, you're providing value, you're showing interest, and, you know, and, and I think to do that, you've got to care, and it shows that you care, and that's what will, re you know, retain that customer long term. Yeah, love it, man. So then, you know, for for lenders, at least you know the, the lenders in my experience that I've worked with, you know, a huge. I mean, you have two clients in most cases, unless you're just specializing in refis and that's all you do, right? But yeah. it's, you know, you've got the the person getting the mortgage, the home buyer, you know, right? Um, but then you have the realtor, right? And and you know, most are going out there and managing those relationships and creating great relationships that are win-win for each other. For those that are watching and listening that maybe don't have a great kind of realtor lender relationship or like what are some of the things that you guys are doing to, to solidify and make sure those are strong, solid win-win relationships? Sure. Well, <clears throat> you know, my team, our company, we truly view the realtor as our client, right? That, that is really our client. I mean, the customer is always our client, but the realtor is our client too. So... I think that, you know, after each transaction, especially in a new relationship, I mean, as I have some realtors that, that we work with that, you know, it, it's, it's, it's like looking at my left hand and right hand, we work so smoothly together. But the first five, ten transactions, we're, you, you know, we're doing, you're doing, uh, you really want to kind of look at your wins and losses on that. You know, hey, where did we work well together? Where did, uh, where did we not work well together? How was communication? How can they get better? All right, let's pick a few of these. Let's try and make sure we focus on these in the next transaction we do together. And this can do a couple things for you. One, it's telling your client, the realtor, uh, showing them again that you care. Um, and it's also telling them, hey, you know what? If it was a little bumpy, I know it wasn't perfect, but these are the three things we're going to work on next time. And they're pretty likely to bring you business back because without realtors, we don't have loans to do. What, what, kind of expectations should you know because sometimes i'll get realtors that that might be i guess disheartened that the relationship doesn't seem mutual you know meaning they're not getting clients back from the lender but as you you mentioned earlier we're more front facing more customer facing you know it's usually the other way around and and i mean what are what are expectations to be that you recommend should be set i guess to to have that healthy relationship yeah, and I mean, I hear that actually a lot, right? Because the realtors are front-facing, as you said. You know, they're out there networking. That's how they get the client. Obviously, they bring that client to, you know, to, to, the, to the loan officer, to, to the mortgage company, mortgage bank, mortgage broker, right, et cetera. Uh, and, and that realtor does need to feel like they're getting something back. I mean, how are you participating uh, in marketing them? I mean, you know, I'd be lying if I said we got, you know, we got 100 calls in a day of people looking to finance our homes and wanted us to, to pair them up with a realtor, right? I mean, that, that would be a phenomenal business model. If you figure that out, let me know. Um, but, uh, but, yeah, you got to kind of look at, you know, what am I bringing back to this realtor? This realtor just got me, brought me a client. It's, it's my job to put this client in the right product and get this loan closed and, the, you know, the realtor on to the next client, Right. So I think you've got to look at, and you've got to, as a realtor, you've got to ask yourself, what is my lender doing for me? Um, you know, are they sitting back and just taking my calls? Uh, you know, are, are they putting some marketing dollars behind behind any marketing campaigns that I'm running? Uh, joint venture agreements? Uh, you know, if I'm if I'm holding an open house, are they at that open house with me? Um, if, if I'm having a happy hour, are they at that happy hour? Are they splitting the cost of the happy hour with me? Um, if, if I'm out talking to CPAs, are they, are they by my shoulder, you know, one day a month talking to the CPAs, informing them about, uh, you know, new products in the marketplace? Am I really, really demonstrating that we're a team? Um, or, you know, am I just a taker, not a giver? Yeah, love it. And the reason I'm asking these questions just about this relationship is I think, 
it's always been important, but I think going forward, it's, it's, and this is just my theory, but I think it's truly more important than ever before, because you do have companies now that are like Quicken that are mm-hmm. you know, a mortgage company, but also a real estate company, you know, right? Mm-hmm. So if one of my clients goes through them, they're going to do everything that they can to get them to raise their hand when they're selling. And they're going to give it to one of their in-house agents. And I'm not going to get recipient, like even given back a, a, a client that I gave to them. You know, right? right. So we, we, yeah. we, industry man, we got to really protect ourselves. And, and I mean, it's, you know, I don't want to say I'm, I'm not afraid of it, but I definitely have my eyes wide open. Yeah. Some of the top loan officers, mortgage consultants, whatever you want to call them in the Valley, um, they'll purchase, you know, you know, they kind of go back to the lead purchase model. They'll purchase finance leads, late funnel finance leads, early funnel finance leads, call them, pre-qualify them, and try and attach them back to their realtors. I mean, that's, that's a great way for reciprocation, a great way for partnership, and kind of a great way for you to put your money where your mouth is. Hey, you know, and again, that doesn't have to be your whole business model. I mean, it could probably work as a whole business model because as soon as you start giving a realtor something, now you've kind of flipped the, you know, flip the switch where you're respecting something back in return. Hey, I've sent you two clients, you know, what, what do I got to do to get your next one, you know? Yep. Now, when it comes to the, the mortgage industry, I know none of us have a crystal ball, but, you know, I, I mean, interest rates have been so low for so long, you know, and, and in my mind, I'm like, man, how long can they keep just giving free money? You know, I mean, what do you see happening in the next, you know, in the near future? Let's just say even like the next 12 months. I mean, do, do you see things kind of stay in status quo or do you see some adjustments there? <clears throat> I think we're going to see rates hover right around where they're at, obviously through the election, right? Um, I, I don't see anything moving substantially, you know, before them and uh, before that, uh, I, you know, and I also think that we're in a lot better position than we were in 2008. Uh, you know, everybody, everybody, I talk to people and they're like, oh, you better stash your money away while you can, Christian, you know, or, oh, you're buying a house now, we're at the top of the market. And yeah, homes are definitely selling at some of the highest prices they've ever sold at. But what you've got to remember is, is there's a couple catalysts that we don't have now that's not creating a bubble. Um, it doesn't seem like we have uh, a lot of people pulling money out of their homes. Well, we have more home equity, I think, now than we ever have. You don't have a lot of people pulling money out of their homes to buy boats cars, things, things that were out of their, their league before, they're, they're a little bit more careful with these. Um, but more importantly, the no income, no asset products are pretty much gone. Um, we don't have those. So, you know, you don't have somebody that, that, that is a lower income candidate and they're sitting on five homes, right? Um, you know, and secondly, we don't have any appraiser interaction, which is, which is what we had before where, you know, we'd say, hey, listen, you know, sure hope this house comes in at 550. You know, and, uh, oh, well, if it doesn't, we're probably going to use uh, the next appraisal company next time. So we don't have a lot of those characteristics in the market. Um, I definitely think we have home buying fever again. I definitely think we have refinance, you know, fever again. But it's a lot more cautious. So I don't see there being a bubble, so to speak. Uh, but like you, I do ask myself, I look I look at the neighborhood that, uh, that I bought my first house in, um, and, you know, first house was like $62,000, and obviously this is some time ago, but homes are selling, uh, selling for half a million dollars for 2,000 square feet in, 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 in that neighborhood now, and I'm just kind of blown away. And I think to myself, more so I think to myself is, that's an entry-level home at this time, right? And granted, it was infill. It wasn't, you know, I know you can get a home for less in Maricopa and other, other outskirts of the valley, but um, I, I do think that, that we're going to have to see some kind of dip, just cyclically, cyclically as an economy as a whole, um, but also just because it, it's got to, you got to have affordable housing, right? But I think we're going to stay stable for the next 12 months. Uh, you know, sorry, long, long answer to your short question. Yep, no, love it, man. So. You know, something that I get asked a lot here on the podcast, you know, YouTube comments or even, you know, just Facebook groups that I'm involved in um, and that I manage and run is, you know, from from the realtor aspect of, because as real estate agents, man, like, look, we don't want to show homes until somebody's pre-qualified. Yeah. You know, but it can be hard to, to, I guess, articulate the value of getting them to pre-qual before you even go show them that first house. 
you know, right? But it, I mean, if you were somebody struggling with that, what, what kind of advice would you give them, you know, as far as value adds of getting pre-qualified, you know, before they go out there and start looking? Yeah, I would, you know, and, and I've seen some realtors that, that do it really well. I mean, obviously, <clears throat> with everybody having home buying fever, as, as I like to call it now, they want to jump out there and start seeing homes right away. And they don't really know what's in their price range. They're not taking into account things like property taxes, homeowners insurance, both of those get escrowed and go towards, you know, your monthly expenditures, um, as, as well as, you know, the other cost of purchasing that home, right, i.e. appraisal, home inspection, et cetera. So I think the way that you can really convey that to the customer is, uh, or to, 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 a, to a real estate client is, hey, this is your largest investment you're ever going to probably make in your life. Now, let's talk a little bit about a number that you're comfortable with. What number are you comfortable with? Because we may be out here looking at four hundred, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollar homes, and you very well may be able to afford that, but you're currently paying fifteen hundred a month in rent, and you know the, your, your your monthly income cost is going to jump to twenty five hundred on that five hundred thousand five hundred thousand dollar home. I want to make sure we're really putting you in a comfortable position to be a homeowner. What I'd like you to do is talk to my friend who's a lender over here, no obligation, you know, why don't you run some numbers with him so you can get a full, you know, crystal ball, so to speak, to use your word, of, of what it's going to look like to own this home. And at that point, you're kind of switching the conversation away from, hey, I need you to get pre-qualified to buy a home, you know, which is kind of saying, I want to make sure I'm not wasting my time, which is something nobody wants to hear, to, hey, this is what my most successful clients do. Let this guy just run some numbers for you, right? Leave the pre-qual out of it, pre-approval out of it. Just let, let this guy run some numbers for you. Let's make sure we're looking on point. Your time's valuable. Yeah, no, love it. It's awesome tips, man. So then, um, you know, I've got numerous friends that operate top, uh, you know, top, top lenders and operate, you know, really successful teams in, in the mortgage space. And, you know, when I go shadow them and we mastermind and meet up, I mean, it's, it's almost identical, you know, right? There's just so many similarities of how you create a successful mortgage team versus, you know, how you create a, a, a successful real estate team. Um, and you guys, man, you've had so much rapid growth and continue to grow and, and are doing such an amazing job with that. And I know in the talking points, you talked about a couple of things that are working really well for you for overall employee retention, as well as, um, uh, uh, discipline, you know, right. Um, can you just elaborate on, on what you're doing for those things and the impact that those are having on, on your organization? Yeah, I think that, um, when you talk about the real estate industry, mortgage industry, we're, we're kind of as an industry, a lagging indicator. And, and by that, I mean, other companies, technology companies, et cetera, move much quicker into that they're not afraid of change, so to speak, right? So I think we're on cue seeing a lot of success is one, with our people. Um, our CEO obviously started the company, and to be a CEO of a company like OnQ, you have to kind of be a visionary, but he truly is. You know, like I mentioned before, we were kind of one of the first companies out there to have that app. I can send you as a realtor, you can send it directly to your client. Uh, they can fill out the whole application on that. Two, you know, different client engagement strategies to making sure that we're supporting, uh, you know, our, our loan officers and our realtors that we partner with. I, I think first and foremost, it comes down to people, you know, within our, with our, in our institution and in, in companies I've been a part of in the past, uh, you know, the people have to be your most valued client, right? So where I may work for the CEO, I'm still his client. And I think that the problem is, is that people forget that. Yeah, a happy employee, employee will have a happy customer, right? Um, and, and I think you know, we built that out, right? We, we have something we just talked about on our, uh, we had our monthly call today. And uh, whenever we hire somebody, we, we send them a little package. And, and, you know, within that package, the first thing they open it up and it says, welcome home, right? And we really want them to feel like they're home. Uh, you know, when we bring them out to our headquarters for training, we set up their hotel rooms and we put them up in, you know, with that same welcome home plaque. 
uh, you know, and other things, just letting them know that they're really a part of the team. We want them to be here with us through, through thick and thin. You know, I mean, our business has a lot of peaks and valleys, right? Um, but I, I think on the second part of that is I, I've got something that, you know, it's a statement that, uh, that I learned early on in, in, in my career, and, you know, self-discipline is the center of all material success, right? And I think if you follow that guideline, you're, you're bound to have success, right? Now, self-discipline, it, it, it can really creep up on you in, in our industry. I mean, uh, it, it's very easy for guys to make five calls a day and, and think, oh, you know what, I had, a, I had a successful day, or make five calls and they actually reach a client, they reach a buyer, they reach a ball, or, oh, hey, I'm good for today, I got, I got a client. You know what, I think I want to go play some tennis with my buddies, right? Um, I, I think in this industry, you know, you've got to work a little bit harder with, with, than everybody else to be that top guy, right? So self-discipline, center of all material success is, is something to live by, man. So with that, man, I mean, we get, I, you know, I, I hear this constantly, you know, right? Oh, I'm, I'm just not disciplined. I don't have willpower, you know, right? For somebody that has those, that thought process, that negative self-talk around that, um, oh. you know, because at the end of the day, we all have limited amounts of willpower. And I don't know if you've read yeah. the book Atomic Habits, but it's one of my favorite books, you know, right? It mm -hmm. talks so much about, about how to become disciplined, you know, right? But it's, it's a systematic and a process approach. I mean, the most successful people that appear to be the most disciplined don't necessarily have to exhaust discipline or willpower. They're just creating systems and processes, if you will, that put them in that, you know, allow them to be disciplined without, I guess, having to think about it. So as you sort of grow in your own self-discipline, you know, cause obviously you've, you know, you, you've, you've reached kind of the, you know, the pinnacle of success in your space. Okay. You know, what would you recommend for people to start flexing that muscle? So they just don't quit and give up. Yeah. I, I think it much like if you decided you were going to go run a marathon, right? You and I wouldn't go out and run 11 miles today or run 21 miles or 23 miles to train for it. Right. We'd fail. We'd give up. We'd be sore for days, and there'd be every excuse in the book about why we're never doing that again, right? So I think you've got to put small changes in place, and if you put those small changes, I'll elaborate on that a little bit, but if you put those small changes in place, when you look back six months later, those small changes have turned, you know, a, a molehill into a mountain, right? You know, so, I mean, some people love the phone, some people hate the phone. Right? Some people don't, they're not desk people, they don't want to send emails, text messages, they don't want to do open houses, they, you know, everybody's got something they don't like doing, right? So everybody always says, focus on what you don't like doing and do that first. And I kind of disagree with that, right? Because you're kind of tackling that marathon that you didn't want to run anyway, right? If you know you like the phone, Set, set a small goal for yourself. It's always structure your day, number one, right? Whatever your office hours are going to be. First of all, if you're in our industry and you're working less than eight hours a day, you're in the wrong industry, right? And if you can do it and make three, four, five hundred thousand a year, call me. I want to come work with you, right? Um, and and by, by, by working, I don't mean, you know, we're not grinding. We're not, we're not building a home from scratch, you know? You know, working, you're working when you're, when you're at dinner, you know, with, with the wife, with the girlfriend. You're talking to the bartender, talking to the table next to you, talking to the people in the ballet line while they're waiting to leave, you know, introducing yourself, just, you know, getting to know people. Um, that can even be work. But to kind of get back to it, you know, if I knew I liked calling, I'd structure the first hour and a half of my day and do some cold calling, right? The next hour would be follow-up calls, right? And I would start with that. Don't create 10 new goals to create this week. Set one new goal, get it done Monday to Friday, see how you're feeling about it, and then slowly trickle or slowly build up to that one that you hate the most. And when you start with that one that you hate the most or you dislike the most, to use a better term, start small. Don't start in an hour and a half. I'm going to do this for 15 minutes on Monday. I'm going to do it for 20 minutes on Tuesday, 25 minutes on Wednesday, etc. And by the time you get to the end of the week and the end of the following week, you'll be able to do it for 45, 50 minutes, and it'll feel like 10 minutes, right? But, but tackle what you can tackle. Yeah, love it, man. So then, you know, you talked about the importance of having great people, 
and, and, you know, at the end of the day, businesses are just a, a group of people working together on the same vision, you know, right? One of the biggest uh, comments I hear from team leaders and brokerage owners are, are their, their biggest frustration, their biggest problem is I can't, can't hire good people. I can't find good people. You know, right? Um, you know, what, how do you go out there and find that great talent? I mean, I'd be lying if I said it wasn't a problem that we have here, right? Um, OnQ is a little different in that uh, we typically don't hire new players to the mortgage industry, right? Um, one, we believe, you know, if you go out there, you look online, our, we've got 4.99 stars on Zillow, 4.99 stars customer satisfaction on Google, and and not that it's bad to hire somebody that's green to the industry, but they really do require a lot of time, right? So we have a pretty expansive, um, we call it business development department, and they go out, research numbers, and, and we try and pick off the best of the best, obviously, from, uh, from, from, our, from our, you know, from, from other mortgage companies, basically, right, from other competitors. Uh, but I think the easiest way and something that I've learned is, you know, for example, let's say uh, we wanted, you know, you know, some of Fairways guys or some of, uh, you know, an unnamed mortgage company. You got to get one great guy from there, right? And you get that one great guy and you treat him like he's king. You give him everything that he wants, obviously, within reason. And then you have him start recruiting for you. Because if you're sitting there telling everybody how great your company is and how much better you are than everybody else, um, you know, it's, uh, it, it, it's not really coming from the horse's mouth. They're expecting you to say, you know, your company's great. Whereas if, if, you, if you're able to bring in one or two guys who are top performing guys and, uh, and, and really give them the tools they need for success, they're going to tell everybody that they come in contact with how great the company they're working for is. And they're inherently going to become your recruiters that you're not even paying for. Yeah, it's powerful stuff, man. And then does that also apply to, does that apply to any position within OnQ that you guys, you know, are looking yeah, for? Yeah, uh, 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 well, I mean, no, it, you know, that, no, we will hire people that are green in, in other departments, obviously, right? And it's not to say we've never brought on, you know, a, a loan officer that was, that was newer to the business, right? Um, if it's somebody that we feel has a lot of tenacity, a lot of drive, we'll bring them on. We've got great regional vice presidents. Um, but, you know, you're typically only as good as, as two things. And one of them is that, that, you know, the tools you're given, and the other one's your leader, right? Um, you know, and uh, we want to make sure if we make that commitment for somebody that maybe has less time in the mortgage industry than, you know, a top performer or a shorter amount of time, um, that we're able to, to provide them what, you know, what they need, right? Not just, to, we're not here to bring anybody on and let them flounder. But uh, yeah, in all of our departments, whether it's underwriting, processing, receptionist, we always promote from within, um, and we always really drive to make them feel at home so that when they're out there talking to other people in the community, um, you know, for example, I've got a transaction coordinator that works for us that had no transaction coordinator experience, but we felt like, you know, she had the skill set to do the job. We brought her in, trained her. She loved the job. She's going to get promoted to a processor probably within the next 30 days. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's, it's just treating your people as you would want to be treating, get, treating, treated, giving them the tools um, and, and, and the leadership that they receive. Um, now, is that, you know, I mean, you hear people throw around the word culture all the time. People are like, oh, I need to improve my culture. But would you say that that is really the, the secret sauce to your guys' great culture that you have? I think we do have a great culture, but I, I agree. People throw around culture, guru, all these other new, you know, terms. And I think really what it comes down to, what, what really is a company's culture, right? Culture isn't free lunch every Friday, free bagels in the, in, in the cafeteria, in the breakfast room, whatever it may be. Culture is, one, does that, poor, does that person feel like they do an important job? Do they take pride in that job? Have you given them pride in that job? Have you given them flexibility to do that job and to add to that job, right? Um, culture is waking up and not thinking, man, I got to go to work today. Waking up is, is you know, culture is, is somebody thinking, 
you know what? I'm going to go to work today. I'm going to have a great day. I might be looking forward to the weekend because nobody wants to work seven days a week, obviously, but, uh, but I'm excited to work with my team. Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, the days of discounted movie passes, gym memberships, free breakfast, lunch, things like that are, are gone, you know. People really want to be more involved in their career. They want to feel appreciated. They need to feel like they're doing a good job. You've got to, as an employer, um, you know, or junior broker to senior broker, you've got to give them the tools to do so. But you also got to give them the tools to make it their own, right? And, uh, and you also got to let them know they're doing a good job, right? That's really what culture is, in, in my opinion. Yeah. So then in order to, 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 I don't want to say, I'm sure you're trying to hire intentionally people that have that growth mindset and that excitement to, to, or the choice to make it a great day, you know, right. Versus the case of the Mondays or whatever it may be, mm-hmm. you know, is that something that you're just intentional with hiring people that are already kind of wired that way and already operate by that way? Or are you guys doing intentional things internally, you know, to, I guess, encourage the growth mindset as well as self-development and, and just ongoing growth. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I think one-on-ones are imperative with that. And the one-on-one shouldn't be a, a meeting about performance. That Keep them totally separate. One-on-one needs to be, hey, we're just doing a quick check-in here, Christian. Just wanted to see how you're feeling about everything. Talk to me about your challenges. Talk to me about your struggles. Uh, talk to me about where you want to go in this position. Hey, how do you think we can get better? You know, too many people use one-on-ones to talk about performance. And when you're talking about performance, nobody's going to be at 100% all the time, right? And I love what I do, too, but there's days where I want to go home and, you know, close all the doors and windows in my house and just turn on whatever TV show I want and hide. I mean, you know, in, in years of my business, we get our teeth kicked in a fair share, you know. And, uh, but I, I think the art of the one-on-one is, is, is not really there anymore. You know, you got to be doing that once a month, making sure your employees are happy, seeing what they have to, to add to their position, other departments they're working with. I, I mean, this is somebody that you're paying as an employee. If you're not fully exploring those areas of their capabilities, their brains, um, and doing it aside from any production talk, you can't even blend the two. Two have to be totally different because in one, you're speaking at somebody, in the other one, you're having a conversation with somebody, right? So I think that's a core of it. Love it, man. So then for yourself personally, you know, right? When you're, when you're a leader, man, it can be an exhausting, draining position to be in, you know, right? Because it's like you're always on and, and there's somebody that always needs something from you and we want to be there for our people. And, but then it's like, then, you know, you get done with, with a day of that at work and then you go home and you have people that also need you. And, like what, what are some things that you do, I guess, to recharge or, you know, to, I guess, shut that, that switch off or, I mean, just to keep yourself from getting burnt out, I guess, if you will. Yeah, no, I totally go home and just take it out on my family. No, I'm totally kidding. <laughs> totally kidding. Totally kidding. Um, you know, I think you've got to find that place. You've got to find something that doesn't let you, and, and you're right, in our business, we're always on. And I'm sure, you know, you do as well, but I'm taking phone calls at 9 and 10 at night sometimes, or they're starting at 6.30 in the morning, and it's cutting into my gym time, or it's cutting into kid time, or when I walk the dog, or, you know, you're right, we're always on, we have to always be positive with the clients, with our employees, and it can, it can get exhausting sometimes. Um, One, you got to kind of love it, but I I think you got to really find something that doesn't allow you, and, and whether it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 45 minutes, whether it's that, that run, that, you know, you've got a horse you go ride. Uh, you just want to sit out on your back patio and think of nothing, you know. I'm not, I'm not a person that meditates, but I know a lot of people that get it from that, right? Um, you know, for me personally, I mean, it's a big part of the steam room at the gym. I can go in there. It's kind of, you know, an unspoken rule. You don't talk to other people in the steam room usually because that's just weird. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, for me, it's the theme room. I can go in there 10 minutes. You feel amazing when you come out, but you've got to find that time where, where it's just you time. And again, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 45 minutes, 
Uh, you know, a lot of people I know, a lot of buddies, you know, spin class. The music's super loud. They can't possibly think about anything else. They're just concentrating on their heart not exploding. Um, and, and, and their mind's just somewhere else. And because when you get out of there in our business, you're going to walk out to 20 texts, 15 texts, 10 texts, emails. Something's gone wrong somewhere. Um, so, yeah, you're right. You've got to carve that out and, and find out what that passion is for you. Love it, dude. So then what do you do? You know, because it's so easy with technology now where, where people can always get a hold of us, you know, right? But man, it's, it's, there's just distractions everywhere. And it can be very difficult to not just have those distractions control your life and be totally productive or, uh, you know, proactive and not, or sorry, reactive, not proactive. Like, what do you do throughout your day to day? Because I mean, you got a lot of shit that you got to get done in addition to get and back in touch with these people and answer, I guess, the, the, you know, interruptions throughout your day, you know, right? Interruption doesn't mean it's not important. Like, what are some of the things that you do to create that structure so you can get it done? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it kind of comes back to, one, you've got to have a great team underneath you. You've got to empower that team. Um, it took me a long time to learn two things. One is that's the art of delegation. And the second being the art of prioritizing things, right? What, what's important in that moment, right? Us, obviously, you know, in our industry, we're dealing with the biggest purchase, biggest investment of anybody's life. So the, the customer is always going to, you know, probably take priority over everything. And this is an area I'm not, I'm not real good at. You know, I don't, I don't have a lot of time to, to turn off. And I feel like anybody that works for me, even if it's not in a department that I have anything to do with within on queue, they come to me with something and, you know, it's just natural inherently. You've got, got to try and help. You want to try. I want to try and help that person. Um, so that, that's a really tough one that I struggle with, probably like a lot of your other listeners. I mean, it's, it's just difficult all around. But I think you've, you've got to be able to delegate, uh, delegate down. And you've got to be able to empower your people. If you're the person that, that has to sign and dot every I and T and cross every T, you're going to burn out. You just absolutely are. You, you got to find a way to, uh, to work in teams and, and divide and conquer. Really. So when you say prioritize and prioritize and delegate, I mean, do you have like a daily kind of reflection and planning process that you do before you start your day just to be able to prioritize your day, but then also delegate out the things that maybe don't need your, your direct attention? Yeah. So I use, you know, a little notebook and I've got, and again, I'm kind of an old school guy. So uh, I, I've got, it, there's a little clip in, it's a to-do list that clips into my binder, right? And, and each night before I, uh, before I go to bed, I look at my to-do list from the day before. I move over what needs to be moved over. I've obviously crossed off everything that, uh, that, I've, that I've gotten done. There's probably been some things between five when I left the office or six when I left the office, checked email again at eight and finally went to bed at 10. Um, you know, that have come up. At that point in time, I'll look at my to-do list for tomorrow. I'll see what I think is feasible. I'll obviously prioritize that. Always, you know, put, put the customer first, you know, any of those prioritizations at the beginning with the customer, meaning, uh, you know, a client, you know, that we're looking to, to secure a loan for or the realtor. Um, but I'll delegate that night before. I, you know, I'll send the email out. Hey, does it look like I'm going to have time to get this tomorrow or you know, a simple email. People naturally want to help other people. Like, not everybody, but inherently people want to help other people. I think you send an email out and, hey, I could really use some help on this. Do you think you can tackle this for me first thing in the morning? You know, and uh, it's, uh, yeah, I run an old school to-do list. Again, move over what, uh, what didn't get done the day before, restructure the priority, and then delegate out there via the email the night before. That way, when... I'm in my car at 7.30 or 8 a.m. on the way to the office. You know, I'm already on business calls. My phone's not blowing up. I don't get to my office. Everything's, I've already got 70 balls in there, and I'm trying to figure out how to tackle my day and prioritize at that point. For me, got to do it the night before. Yep. Love it, man. Love it, dude. So, you know, those that maybe haven't experienced rapid growth, you know, right? Um, th this may not make sense to them, you know, but uh, for those that have experienced rapid growth, you know, usually it does, you know, but uh, growth pains can be worse than slow pains. 
you know, right? Um, what have been, I mean, you guys have grown or continue to grow so fast. And as you're expanding, what have been some of the biggest growth pains that you've had to overcome? I mean, wow, there's been a lot of them. Um, you know, we kind of already talked about hiring and hiring the right people, so I won't really dive into that. Um, I think it's the ebbs and flows of the processes, right? For us as a company, um, our operations team does an amazing job. But, you know, I feel like there's, when, when it comes to operations, uh, there is, there's, there's two categories, sitting idly or way oversold, right? So either, either we're sitting idly, we don't have enough business coming in, and, and our operations staff, whether it be processors, underwriters, TCs, my loan officers, um, you know, are twiddling their thumbs, or, you know, we have a huge generation month and everybody's in panic mode. And, uh, and you know, when, when, it, when it comes to that, uh, a lot of times we'll look to outsource some of that to take some of the load off of our staff. It's a great way to, to hold, uh, you know, we can outsource underwriting, outsource other positions. Uh, we want to keep our core staff, but we also want to make sure we don't burn them out, right? So by being able to outsource, I'll just use underwriting, for example, we can flip the switch and increase our volume by 30% if we need to, you know, if we have an explosive month, um, you know, like, uh, like, like, like we did last year, you know, a few times. Yeah. Love it, man. Love it. So then Christian, if uh, those that are watching, listen, man, I mean, I know that you guys are almost in every state right here in the United States at this point. If uh, anybody that's watching or listening wants to, to get in touch with uh, you guys at on cue, um, where's the best place to go do that at? Yeah, I mean, you know, we've got our 800 number on our website. I mean, I'll give you my, uh, my direct contact number. Uh, my direct contact number is uh, 480-320-3095. Again, that's 480-320-3095. As well as my email is uh, Christian, C-H-R-I-S-T-I-A-N dot Olin, O-L-I-N. So Christian dot Olin at onqfinancial.com. And, you know, we love to be a resource. We love to be a resource for borrowers, for realtors. Um, you know, it's, it's a big world out there. There's a lot of terms. There's a lot of different scenarios. Uh, you know, we, we love questions, man. So fire them at us. Yeah, love it. And you guys that are watching or listening to this, wherever you're at, we'll have all that contact information right below for you to make it easy on you. So just one last question for you, Christian. I mean, you've been – been at this game for, for some time now. And uh, it was with knowing everything that you know now today, if you could go back to your earlier version of yourself when you first started this journey and give yourself two pieces of advice, knowing what you know now today, they feel it would just fast forward to your success trajectory that you're on right now, the success journey. What would those two pieces of advice look like? Probably... It may be more than two, but probably two, uh, you know, one, keep the blinders on. Don't get sidetracked. If you make up your mind you're going to go into real estate uh, or you're going to go into to mortgage, do it, one, because you like it. Um, but keep the blinders on. You're going to see a lot of people that don't make it along the way, and you're going to see a lot of people that do. Don't get sidetracked by what others are doing. Find something that works for you. Keep the blinders on, the earplugs in. Don't, don't, don't get brought down by the naysayers. You know, if it's your passion, it's what you want to do. Um, you know, and, uh, and, and the second is always remind yourself that everything's going to be okay. This is going to work out. I mean, uh, on, my, on days that I've left here where, I mean, I, I just felt like I was falling apart, it's miraculous. You go home, you go to bed, you wake up the next day, and – it's a new day, and you just got to focus on that. And, and just, you're always going to, this business is a bumpy business inherently. You know, there's, we try and keep it as smooth as possible, but there's a lot of moving parts. You just got to always remember, everything's going to end up okay. You're going to end up right where you're supposed to. I think for the first part of my career, um, and even a little bit today, you know, I came into a change, and I was in panic mode. I mean, I was running around the building looking for a high rafter and a rope to hang myself from. Um, you know, and, you know, it's 1.50. This all started about 9 a.m. today, and I'm like, okay, I think we're going to be okay. You know, but it was a change that could have inherently hurt the business. And you know what? We got it worked out. May have ruffled some feathers along the way. 
but uh, but it's always going to be okay. Those are probably the two pieces of advice I give. Uh, powerful advice, man. And those watching and listening, I know I end every podcast with this, but information without implementation is truly just the start of delusion. Information is a power. It's taking that information, taking massive action on it. That gives you the power to create the life that you know you want and deserve. And Christian shared so many amazing pieces of advice with you guys today. Take something that you learn and get out there and take immediate action on it. And Christian, again, man, I truly appreciate you being here. This has been an honor. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy to be here, man. This has been a lot of fun. Thanks, man. I so much appreciate it. Thanks again for reaching out. Uh, I, I really enjoyed it. Love to do it again with you, and uh, I hope your listeners are able to gather something great out of it or take, take some snippets out of it. Thanks again. Yep, 100%, my friend. All right, you guys, thank you so much for watching and listening. We will see you next time.